Hi, you're watching Science of a Banana. That's me, I'm the banana. Before we get started, I have two links I want you to check out below. One is the subscribe button, and the other is a link to my Patreon, because being a jobless undergrad is hard. Today we're talking about albino redwoods. Yes, that is a thing. Turns out albino plants in general are a thing, but they might be different than albino redwoods. You see, one big identifier of a parasitic plant is albinism, which indicates a lack of chlorophyll, the green part of a leaf on a plant. Because without chlorophyll, leaves can't photosynthesize, which means they can't make their own food. And since they can't make their own food, albino plants will tap into healthy plants to absorb that plant's nutrients. Kind of like a vampire, because vampire plants are also a thing. However, biologist Zane Moore and arborist Tom Stapleton have reason to believe that when it comes to redwoods, these trees are not producing little vampire saplings, despite there being over 400 recorded cases of albino redwoods throughout California and the Pacific Northwest. Now, redwoods are something of a community tree. Rather than producing new growth through seeds, which they can do, sprouts tend to grow directly from the parent plant when the tissue beneath the bark is exposed to direct sunlight. These sprouts are technically clones and will tap into the parent tree's root system for nutrients. In fact, Many redwood saplings will survive just fine in the shade for years until an opening is provided in the canopy for them to finally thrive on their own in a phenomenon known as release. But it's not just their little clone saplings that redwoods take care of. During winter and early spring, redwood trees will share nutrients with one another across the expansive forest system. And this sharing of nutrients does kind of sound like ideal conditions for a parasitic plant like an albino redwood to survive and thrive, except redwoods are also known for culling the bits and pieces that aren't pulling their weight. Because there's this thing that happens in the summer called needle drop, where leaves and branches will be shed if they're failing to work up to code for the redwood system. Now, how are redwoods able to keep up this year-round system? I don't know, but the fact that their DNA has 32 billion base pair genomes might have something to do with it. And just for reference, the human genome sequence is only 3 billion. That's a pretty big difference. So how is it the albino redwood is able to stay in the nurturing category and avoid the yearly needle drop. Zane Moore, the biologist I mentioned earlier, believes that albino redwoods are actually in a symbiotic relationship with the parent tree. Through lab studies, it was discovered that the albino samples contained toxins that were twice as high as the green leaf counterpart. This means that while the albino redwoods were absorbing the standard nutrients, they were also taking on more than their fair share of heavy metal toxins as well. Well, we're talking enough that would normally kill a healthy redwood tree 10 times over. Zane Moore believes that albino redwoods are acting as a reservoir for toxins to help keep the parent tree system healthy in exchange for nutrients in order to survive. How it's surviving with all those toxins is a bit of a mystery, although Zane Moore did notice some significant differences on a cellular level between the albino leaves and the regular redwood leaves. Now, as neat as the idea of seeing an actual albino redwood is, don't don't be so quick to try and find one. Because of this new belief that they're actually helping the redwood system survive in today's polluted climate, as well as because of their rarity, their locations are kept on the down low from the general public. If you enjoyed today's topic, be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on my future scientific findings. And please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can dedicate more time to creating these educational videos to share with you.